morning, everybody. My name is Rhonda Palmer. It's great to be here with you. I'm happy to invite you to worship at Asbury today. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. If it is your first time, please pull out your phone and text welcome to this number, 281-305-1069. And then follow the link to a quick connection card and provide a little bit of information about yourself. It'll help us get to know you better. We can tell you a lot more about our church. But if you have worshiped here before and you're a normal person that's here regularly, go ahead and type in the word here to that same number, 281-305-1069. Thanks for letting us know you're here. We like to take attendance and give people gold stars for showing up. I'm lacking a few gold stars. Anyway, hey, we are in the midst of our Super Bowl of Caring. It's in full swing. This is our annual canned food drive, and we're doing this from now until Super Bowl Sunday. Our youth group is the sponsor of this program every year, and for the first time this year, all of that canned food is going to go into our own blessing box here at Asbury. So let's help them reach their goal. They're trying to reach 500 non-perishable food items. This afternoon, we're going to host an Encounter Youth Parents Meeting at 1 o'clock in the community room. Everybody who has a child that will be in the youth we hope that y'all can join us and hear about the fun upcoming events for the summer mission trips. And then everybody, please look for a letter in the mail coming this, this week. It's going to give details about our upcoming fundraiser. Save the date for our big meeting here. The Congre congressional meeting will be February 6th at 10 a.m. here in the sanctuary. And you'll have an opportunity to just ask questions and get a deeper understanding of what's going on. And then that fundraiser will be held on February 27th at 3 p.m. You're going to have a chance to get to sign up and go to a small group meeting at someone's home and ask a lot of questions. And from now until then, we just ask that you pray. Pray for our church. Pray for yourself and how you might contribute in what way. And, and then hopefully make a pledge to uh, contribute and help us out. Again, thanks for worshiping with us today. If you're worshiping on Facebook, we hope that you will say hello and also use those emojis as you're listening to the choir or listening to our pastor. React. Push one of those buttons or put a word to let us know something that resonates with you. And while we're in here, even though your mask is covering your face and you're staying safe, we can see the smile and the twinkle in your eye. So wave and smile as we sing along and have a good time at worship today. Thank you. If you've been a part of the Methodist Church for many, many years, this is a very familiar hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Uh, if you're at home, please sing along with us. If you're in the sanctuary, stand as you're able, and we will sing. It's page 64 in the hymnal if you wish to follow along that way. Please join us in singing.
please remain standing and join us in the affirmation of faith. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, friends. If you are here in the sanctuary, I invite you to come on up to the front. I want to say hello to any friends worshiping with us at home. I'm glad you're joining in. Oh, great. I got a friend coming. All right, Mr. Max and friends at home. So I have two cups of liquid here, okay? The first cup is an orangey-yellow color, right? And it smells kind of fruity. Any thoughts what it might be? Can you see it? Orange juice, exactly. So if I drink it, do you like orange juice? Maybe? It tastes like orange. It does taste like orange. If I drink it, it puts good things into my body like vitamins and energy, right? It's a pretty healthy way to start the day, taken in moderation. Now my second cup of liquid, it's a dark color and it's kind of fizzy. Any thoughts what it might be? Coca-Cola, exactly, it is. And it may taste pretty good, but it has a whole lot of sugar in it. And it's really not too healthy for my body if I drink this, even though I like it. Okay, so our Bible story today from the book of Colossians in the New Testament talks about putting something else into our bodies and minds. God's word, or the Bible, right? It says to let the word of God, all the teachings in the Bible, live inside your heart and to thank God for this. So all the stories that are in here. And Paul who was the disciple that wrote that book, Colossians, wants the word of God to fill up every little aspect of our life and everything we do, even how we go about doing it. And then he says we should sing praises and songs of thankfulness to God for this. Now, Paul says that we're, when we're growing up as a Christian, that's some pretty important stuff, whether we're learning to ride a bicycle or struggling to learn math at school or maybe trying to cope with a neighborhood bully. We can always turn to the Bible for guidance. And we, we, all, we will always be facing new things, right, as we grow. And we can use the teachings of the Bible in our hearts to rely on that and to trust in God's goodness. We can ask questions and talk together about God and his word and the Bible to keep us growing as God's people. Now, let's go back to my orange juice and my Coke. We said that this Coke, in number two, it may taste good, but it's probably not as healthy, right? and that the orange juice in cup number one provides our bodies with vitamins and energy, and it's a healthier way to start the morning. So this Coke here may be like video games, if we were to play them all day, maybe like eating candy or ice cream for dinner, or maybe like uh, watching YouTube instead of doing our homework, all of those kinds of things, right? And the orange juice may be like reading the Bible, reading devotionals with our family, memorizing scripture, maybe attending church and Sunday school like you're doing today and praying, right? All these things can help me grow as a disciple of Jesus. So we have to think about what we're inputting into our heart. Are we putting in junk or are we putting in God's word? God yeah, that's what, exactly what we want to do. So now it doesn't have to be one or the other, but God's word should come first and can impact everything we do in our life. We can learn so much from the Bible to help us grow, and reading the Bible is like a great adventure. It tells us all about God's work, his people, and the Savior Jesus who came to save us. And you can go to God's word anytime, when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're troubled about something, and you can never get too much of God's word. In fact, God wants us to be in his word. It's how we know what, Jesus, what God wants for us. In Colossians 3, 16 in the Bible tells us so. And all of this helps us live a new life with Jesus. So I want you to dive in deep and go into deep into God's word. Will you pray with me now? 
Dear God, thank you for your word in the Bible and for the stories that help us understand how much you love us and how we can live. Help us learn more each day as we grow, worship, serve, and share in your love. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we all say, Amen. Thanks, guys. Well, good morning. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord with you today. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us online, I want to welcome you. I am Lindsay, the pastor here at Asbury. In the last few days, I was attending a retreat for the Impact Leadership Program in our community that I was asked to be a part of. And so, you know, I was really excited about this because all the leadership things I've ever gotten to do, kind of like leadership training things, has been within the church. And this was going to be my first opportunity to be in a leadership thing with people from all over the community, from businesses and nonprofits and school districts and all kinds of things. So we get together, and I'm like so excited to like step out of my comfort zone a little bit. And guess what I discover? Almost every single one of them talked about how their faith was what motivated them to be the kind of leader that they are. And I was like, wait a second, I thought this was not church, you know? But it, I got to tell you, it was so encouraging to me to go in a place where I wasn't really on that train of thought, and I'm encouraged by other people's faith. And it also reminded me of the great opportunity we have, without even really realizing the effect, to be able to just share that God's a part of our life and what that can do for somebody else's walk with the Lord too. So I wanted to share that with you and just kind of celebrate some of the great um, faithful leadership that we have in our community. A few folks that I want you to ask you to be praying for this week. Um, Julie is one of our uh, nursery workers. Her father is still in the hospital. Harry Porter's been recovering. Tina Abel and her fight with cancer. Ernie also broke as he recovers. Olga's sister, Olivia, who's also fighting cancer, and Suzanne Morgan, too. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and our hearts as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Jesus, we thank you that we don't face our lives alone, that the only times where we um, use up our own strength is whenever we're not leaning on you for yours. We thank you, Lord, that uh, not only do you go with us everywhere that we go, but that you lead us, that you encourage and equip us, that things come our way that we could not handle on our own, but we can with you. We pray, Lord, that we would be people who are so hungry and thirsty for your leadership and guidance in our life that we cannot help but seek you out through the pages of scripture, in our prayer life, in holy conversation with godly friends. Help us, Lord, just kind of enrich us, fill us up with your teachings and your guidance so that we can be renewed in the way that we encounter every day. God, we lift up our friends to you this morning who are going through hard times, maybe our enemies too. We lift their names to you silently now. We pray, Lord, that they would discover that you are the God of all comfort, that you would become real for them in a way that you haven't ever before, and that this would draw them deeper and closer to you and not farther away. Use us however you see fit. We pray for our community, for our nation, and for the world, that you would raise up um, people who you can use um, to help bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you for all the ways that you meet us on a daily basis. Help us not to miss it. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear every time that you speak with us, Lord. We give these gifts to you. We ask that you bless them and use them according to your purpose. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time in our service where we do take up our offering. You will have a chance in a moment to stand and take your gifts to the offering plates by the back doors here in the church. You can also give a gift through a check in the mail or through our website or your own bank online, which is the way we usually give, or through text message. I want to say thank you to everyone who's a partner in what God's doing here at Asbury. <laughs> Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the way that you, uh, that you give us encouragement and strength through the body of Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would use this time to speak directly to each one of us here today, that we would really dig in, that when things become a challenge, that we wouldn't just give up, but it would cause us to seek farther, and that we would be rewarded with a deeper relationship with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, when a couple starts dating, there are, I think, two different categories of questions. There's the things you need to know first, and then there's everything else, you know? So first, particularly on that first date, maybe second date, you're asking questions like, where are you from, and what do you do, and what's your family like? And then there are other questions that come later that are not quite as important, like what's your favorite movie or your favorite dessert? You're not going to ask somebody some crazy specific question on a first date unless you want to scare them off, which you might very well want to do. It depends on the date. In fact, so uh, recently I googled like 
things that the internet suggests that you ask on a first date. And I got some pretty strange responses. Questions like, is cereal technically a soup? That's what one website suggests you ask. Or, would you rather eat poison ivy or a handful of bees? Uh, side note, it's a really good idea to base your life decisions based off of what you find on the internet. Uh, so maybe, maybe as you go along, ridiculous questions may come up as like a little funny thing. But with the first date and the first questions, all you're trying to do is you're trying to get a sketch of the person's character, of the foundations of understanding what kind of person they are. And you can't have any understanding of what somebody is about if you don't know the basic facts of their life. The same is true in an interview for a new job. You want to know like the foundational relevant pieces that are going to give you hints as to whether or not this person is a good candidate. Maybe their educational background or their experience in the field. You are not going to ask them about their favorite fast food in the interview, interview you know. But there are some things you just can't understand unless you ask the most important questions first. And when it comes to being a Christian, right after the questions of who is God, and do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and ask for his forgiveness and trust in his grace, there is another first question that has to, has to, has to get answered in order for you to start your life as a Christian. Unfortunately, there are some folks who never get around to articulating an answer. And here's the question. What does the Bible mean to me? What does the Bible mean to me? So as we're going throughout our message today, if you have a piece of scrap paper, maybe you like to take sermon notes, or if you're just kind of like reviewing and thinking in your mind as we're talking today, I want you to see if you can come up with a one-sentence answer to that question, okay? What does the Bible mean to me? All right. Last week, I asked you to be reading Colossians chapter 3, verses 10 through 17, Every day for these few weeks, I got to admit, I didn't get to it every day myself, but I hope you did. And even if you didn't this past week, I encourage you to give it a shot this week. It is a keystone passage in the Bible about what it need, means to be renewed, to be spiritually renewed. At this time of the new year, Paul says to us, look, take off the old mess of your life before God and put on God's nature. Be the image of God. Be renewed by putting on God's character, God's nature. And he gives us some specifics about what that renewed life is going to look like. Last week, we talked about a, having a renewed understanding of forgiveness and how that allows us to have renewed relationships in our lives. And then for this week in verse 16, as part of that passage, he says, the word of Christ must live in you richly. Will you say that with me? The word of Christ must live in you, not your, richly. <laughs> Eugene Peterson in his translation, the message says it this way, let the word of Christ have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Kenton and I have been watching a TV show called The Rookie. Has anybody heard of that or seen that? Okay, it's a cop show. And the thing that stands out to me over other cop shows that I've seen is that they really show how much you have to know and keep in mind at every single moment. You never know what situation is going to come up in your day, so you have to know the handbook so well. It has to be so sunk in, so deep in each police officer that they are able to call upon any aspect of the playbook at any given moment. They're always like pulling out their walkie-talkies and saying, you know, going through all of the procedures. So here's a traffic stop. Okay, here's the 15 things I have to do right. I got to park the car this way. I got to approach them like this. There, oh, there's a robbery in progress. Here's the 20 rules in place to guide how I handle that. It's amazing. Lawyers, a similar thing. They have to know every single detail of every law that applies in their case so that they can guide their client to the best possible conclusion. You don't want a lawyer who kind of remembers some of the law. You want one who knows every single detail 
backwards, front, sideways, all of it. Same thing with cooking. It can be downright unpleasant if you don't follow the recipe. If you skip a step or you forget an ingredient. Do you know what happens more often than not to me? I start cooking or baking, and because I didn't consult the recipe first, I only take a look at it when I'm like already halfway through, and then I'll be in the middle of baking something and realize I don't have like one or five of the ingredients. And if you don't know the recipe by heart, or if you go ahead and get started and only consult it later, you can end up in a whole lot of mess that could have been avoided. My poor neighbor came by. She can't, I can't tell you how many times I've texted her asking her for a little more flour or one more egg. But these days, not everybody agrees about the place of the Bible, the Bible's authority. Some people think it's just an old book. Many people read one or two verses that seem backwards or harmful, and they decide to toss the whole thing. Lots of people think maybe it was helpful a long time ago, but it is too outdated for today. And in the Methodist Church, we actually have a pretty helpful tool, a pretty helpful way of thinking about the Bible. For, for us, the Bible is still, it's tops. The Bible has more authority in our lives than any other source of knowledge. When a cop wants to know how to handle a situation, he consults the handbook. When a lawyer wants to know how to win a case, she consults the law. When a Christian wants to know what to do or how to be or what does he or she do, they read the, the Bible. It's our primary source of knowing God's heart for us, God's hopes and dreams and expectations and deal breakers in our lives. But we know that the Bible is full of lots of different kinds of writings, different genres. You read poetry like Psalms, different than you would read a law book like Leviticus. You read philosophy, like Ecclesiastes, different than you're going to read history, like one of the Gospels. And we also know that every single person who reads is wearing at least three pairs of glasses when they read. You like my little graphic here? And these are glasses that you cannot take off, okay? And we read through the lens of all three of these things. We read through the lens of reason, of our own ability to think and figure things out, of making sense of things. We read through the lens of our tradition, what we've been told it means by others who came before us. And we read through the lens of our own personal experience. And this is not a problem, right? We can't help but have these things inform how we read and interpret and understand the Bible. Each one of them are tools that help us figure out to do with a given passage of Scripture. And none of them, tradition, reason, or experience, though, none of them ever trump Scripture, okay? But they do guide us in understanding whether to take a verse literally or not. Whether the surface teaching presented to the original hearers of the Scripture is intended to also be the same teaching for us today or not. One quick example. The Bible says women cannot wear gold, and they cannot braid their hair. Okay? Did you know that? Our tradition tells us that women have been wearing gold wedding rings for a long time, right? And experience shows us that there's plenty of godly women who sometimes wear braids. But it is our reason that is particularly helpful in figuring out this one. If we do our research, what we come to understand is that when that book of the Bible was written, the only women who could afford to live this way lived incredibly extravagantly. In fact, they had slaves who were hairstylists. That was their only slave responsibility was as their hairstylist, okay? And so these are people who are living incredibly extravagantly. So we use our ability to reason to interpret these passages today, not as saying to us today that we can't wear gold or braid our hair, but that living extravagantly doesn't usually represent Christ well, okay? And there's nobody whose interpretation of Scripture we can trust as much as we can trust the way that Jesus interpreted Scripture. Fortunately for us, there are multiple times in Jesus' ministry when we see him wrestling with Scripture, explaining his process for how he interprets it. And so today, what we're really going to do is take a look at a passage that shows Jesus wrestling with the Old Testament. And see if we can't get some clues 
for how we can let the word dwell richly within us today. Okay, all ready for that? Okay, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 12 today. I'll give you a second to find it or pull it up on your device. It's the first book of the New Testament, but you see how far back I have to go in my Bible to find it. Matthew 12, starting in verse 1. All right, here we go. At that time, Jesus went through the wheat fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they were picking heads of wheat and eating them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Well, look, your disciples are breaking the Sabbath law. But he said to them, Haven't you read what David did when he and those with him were hungry? He went into God's house and broke the law by eating the bread of the presence, which only the priests were allowed to eat. Or, haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple treat the Sabbath as any other day and they're still innocent? But I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I want mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus left that place and went into their synagogue, and a man with a withered hand was there. Wanting to bring charges against Jesus, they asked, Does the law allow a person to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus replied, Who among you has a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath and will not take hold of it and pull it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? So the law allows a person to to do what is good on the Sabbath. And then Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he did. And it was made healthy, just like the other hand. And the Pharisees went out and met in order to find a way to destroy Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, throughout the Gospels, we find Jesus clashing with religious leaders over how to observe the Sabbath. And sometimes I think we just kind of skip over those stories because we're like, eh, we figured that out. We can move on to the next thing, right? But actually, these stories teach us about how Jesus is wrestling with the Bible. Every time that Jesus heals somebody on the Sabbath, they're mad at him. Here, not only does that happen, but they're walking through wheat fields and they pick a few heads of wheat and eat them while they're walking, similar to what Ruth would do in Boaz's fields, if you remember that story. So the Pharisees say, hey, you're breaking the Sabbath. Not only is Jesus healing people on the Sabbath, but he's doing farm work, aka feeding themselves to the horror. And I know this seems pretty outdated to us. Have you ever wondered why this issue is brought up so many times in the Gospels? Let's dig into it a little bit, okay? The scripture, which is the primary authority, was pretty clear. No work. People could bake and prepare their food the day before so that they didn't cook on the Sabbath. You didn't travel on the Sabbath. You were only allowed to go so many steps from your own home on the Sabbath. You didn't help anybody on the Sabbath that you could just wait a few hours and help them the next day, which admittedly almost every person Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he could have just as easily waited and healed them on the next day, right? So we know the scripture. What was their experience though? Remember the, that lens? Well, about 150 years before Jesus, while a man named Mattathias was a priest, some Macedonian, this was him, some Macedonian enemies came to a Jewish town on the Sabbath and attacked the whole village. Uh, not a single person in that village would pick up a weapon and defend themselves because it was the Sabbath. So what do you think happened? Every single man, woman, and child died. About 1,500 people. Mattathias, the priest, heard about this and made a declaration. It was now acceptable to defend yourself on the Sabbath. Why? Because based on the experience, he now reasoned that if they didn't do this, then eventually all their enemies would only attack them on the Sabbath and they would pretty soon be wiped out, right? Mattathias is using experience and reason 
to reinterpret the Old Testament law. Guess how long it took the rest of the Jewish leaders to decide that he was right? How long did it take them? Make a guess. If you said 300 years, then you would be correct. It took 300 years before all the Sadducees, Pharisees, and rabbis, and everybody else agreed that he was right. Even back then, the church moved real slow. Because in their eyes, right, he was sinning. He was telling them to do something that the Bible said not to do. The Bible says, don't lift a hand. Mattathias was saying the opposite. In their minds, he was encouraging a life of sin and reinterpreting the scripture in light of present knowledge and experience is tricky because if you're not careful, you'll just excuse anything. And the scripture itself becomes meaningless and you can just make it mean whatever you want it to mean, right? So for 300 years, this was the dividing issue between Jews who maintained a traditional interpretation And Jews whose knowledge and experience caused them to reinterpret that scripture differently. Jesus is living right smack in the middle of that 300-year-old argument. Mattathias was 150 years before him. It is the hot-button issue of the day. So, of course, it comes up so many times in his ministry. So what does Jesus do? How does he interpret scripture? We have two examples in this one passage. And both times, Jesus does something a little different, but still connected. First, the wheat. By picking heads of wheat, they are technically working, even though it's just to feed themselves, even though there's no cooking involved. They're literally just putting, pulling a grain with their arm and putting that in their mouth. So when the Pharisees confront him, Jesus turns to, what does he turn to? Scripture. He reminds them of the story of David. He reminds them of the Levites, who are kind of like the equivalent of today's church staff, that they work on the Sabbath. So Jesus uses a few instances within Scripture itself to show that on occasion exceptions are allowed. So sometimes when we don't know how to understand a particular verse, we can go to another part of Scripture and put those two into conversation with each other to better assess the true meaning. You see how that works? But then there's the healing of the man with the withered hand. And this one is more tricky. Because here's the truth. Jesus could have waited till the next day, right? Like one more day wasn't going to kill this guy. It's not like he was bleeding out or anything. If he's made it however long with his hand in like this, surely he could have waited one more day without risking sinning. The Pharisees' Sabbath restrictions forbade the following activities. Writing, erasing, tearing, conducting business transactions, shopping, cooking, baking, kindling a fire, gardening, doing laundry, carrying anything for more than six feet in a public area, moving anything with your hand, even indirectly, like with a broom, a broken bowl, flowers in a vase, candles on a table, raw food, a rock, a button that has fallen off, You would have to wait until the next day to pick it up. This is just a partial list, okay? There is nothing in the Old Testament that indicates that healing is an exception, that it is allowed, never says it. So Jesus does not have much ground to stand on in Scripture the way he could about the wheat, okay? There's no conflicting passages here. It's clear. Don't do it. So he appeals to people's experience and reason instead. In Luke, when this same story is told, he says, which of you, if your child or your ox fell in a ditch, wouldn't do the work of helping it get out of the ditch on the Sabbath? Just like he talks about the sheep that we just heard of in Matthew. In other words, Jesus is pointing to the nature of God, which is always working towards life, Rather than towards death. That's the devil's work. That's Satan, right? God is always working towards life. And he's saying that because we're made in the image of God, it is acceptable for us to do anything that goes in the direction of life on the Sabbath. 
God's work in the world is always in the direction of life from the very first moment of creation through today. So we have permission to work in that direction too because we're made in his image. There's no scripture that he can quote. Instead, he's quoting to a theme of the Bible, the character of God that we see revealed throughout scripture to make his case. Jesus goes ahead and heals the guy because doing so promotes a better life for him. And Jesus is able to do it, is able to reinterpret Scripture in a way that is outside its historical, traditional interpretation because the Word dwells richly in him. Because he knows the whole story well enough to be able to pick up the main themes. In the case of the wheat, he knows little examples within Scripture that give a foundation for his actions. And in the case of the healing, while he can't point to one specific Scripture to support his actions, he can point to the overall theme of Scripture and say, look, the nature of God is revealed in Scripture as X, so that gives us direction today to do Y. Jesus is never getting around Scripture, and he never throws it away. He knows it so well It's rooted in him so deeply, it allows him to engage Scripture as his ultimate authority while also providing room for reinterpretation. That's part of the power of the Sabbath stories in the gospel today. They teach us how Jesus understood and interpreted Scripture. When I talk with young people today about the Bible, if they know anything about it at all, they'll point to Scriptures that seem to accept violence against women, passages that seem to encourage genocide, passages that have been used to keep people in abusive relationships, and they say, how in the world can you say that the Bible is good? Right? Have you ever heard anyone? How can you want to use this as a guide in your life? It's toxic. These are reasonable questions. What I have found is that like Jesus did with the wheat, we can point to other scriptures that cause us to re-examine those passages in a different light. Wait, this passage over here seems to condone slavery? Well, over here in Philemon, Paul says a brother can't own a brother, and we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So Philemon, you need to release that slave Onesimus. You can put those in conversation with each other. It causes you to reinterpret other times. Like Jesus with the healing on the Sabbath, you can point to the overarching story of God. The character of God is displayed throughout Scripture as a way of kind of re-questioning, re-examining those verses in a different way. But you know what you can't do? You can't do either of those things with integrity if the Scripture doesn't already dwell within you richly. Because you have to know it well enough to be able to do it faithfully. And there's so much goodness in the Bible, so much life, so much encouragement and hope that we rob ourselves of if we let our wrestling with certain passages keep us from benefiting from any of it. Almost 15 years ago, the Center for Biblical Engagement began a study that has since included 400,000 people from 24 different countries and 75 different denominations, depending on the age bracket, because it's It's uh, stratified out by age, either 17 to 40 percent of participants in each age bracket never read scripture at all. Another 30 to 45 percent look at a verse one to two to three times a week. And 25 to 40 percent of people said that they read scripture four or more times a week, four or more times a week. And what they found was staggering. There was hardly any difference at all between folks who didn't read at all and folks who read between one and three times a week. No statistical difference. But for those who read four or more, they were 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness, 228% more likely to share faith with others, 407% more likely to memorize scripture, and between 57 to 74% less likely to get drunk, have extramarital sex, or get caught up in pornography or gambling problems. There is a difference between hearing scripture every once in a while or on Sundays and letting the scripture dwell richly within you. A couple weeks ago, our dog Daisy passed away. We've had her for 11 years. 
This is her with our son, Brayden. She had bone cancer. And uh, Brayden had a really hard time with it, really hard, because uh, she's been there his whole life. And he's never had that kind of loss before. You know, he's been pretty fortunate. So we could tell that she was getting worse and worse, and Brayden was starting to ask a lot of questions about death and whether heaven is real or not and all this stuff. And when the day came when we realized, you know, Kenton was having to carry her into the backyard to use the bathroom, it, it had gotten real bad. We said, tomorrow is going to be the day, guys. He just lost it. The next day, we're saying goodbye. He loses it. We go out to the driveway and put her in the car. As soon as the trunk closes, he runs into the house, slams the door, goes up to his bedroom, says, I need to be alone. Slams the, he's never done this before. He's not that, he, he never wants to be alone. <laughs> and he's just bawling and bawling. So I give him a few minutes, and I, I'm trying to distract myself. I'm sweeping. <laughs> and I decide I'm going to give him five minutes, and then I'm going to go up in his bedroom. Within four minutes, he comes downstairs. He says, Mama, I have something to tell you. I said, okay, what is it? He said, God just talked to me. I said, really? What did God say, Braden? He said, God told me that he's up in heaven making a home for us, our family, and, and that Daisy's going to be there too, and it's okay. After that moment, guys... He was totally different. He had peace about it. He was okay. An hour and a half later, when Kenton let me know that it was done, I told the kids. Brayden said, I'm okay. I know where she is. And that's how he's been ever since. God used the teachings of John chapter 14. I go ahead to prepare a place for you. Right? In my house, there is many rooms. God used scripture to totally change my son's experience of a, of a challenging thing in his life, right? That is what Scripture can do. Scripture can give us hope when we feel completely hopeless. Scripture can give us direction whenever we feel like we have nowhere, no idea where to do, how to go. Scripture, when it's dwelling richly in us, actually changes our life, actually changes the way that we move through something. And I want that for you. I want that for you. The Bible has the power to renew your life, renew how you are looking at something, how you handle something. Of course, first of all, by showing us the pathway to salvation. That's the real renewal, right? But also to transform how you feel about how confident you are in, in your faith, what decisions you make, whether these decisions are going to bring harm or promote life. So, so I want to encourage you today to get real clear, real clear about what the Bible means to you. Have you been thinking about that? Remember at the beginning I asked you to be thinking about your definition? If you don't have your sentence yet, that's your homework for today. I want you to go home and be able to write in one sentence what the Bible means to you. Because this is one of the most foundational questions. It's one of the first questions that you've got to be able to answer. And if we really believe that the Bible is like the primary source of knowledge about God and our spiritual lives, then we need to live like it is. So if you are not yet in the practice of letting the God's word renew you by letting it dwell within you richly, then I am issuing you a challenge today. We're going to call it the four or more challenge, okay? So here it is. Between now and Easter, now and Easter, I want you to make a commitment to read scripture four or more times a week. If it's every day, that's even better. But pick the days and the times of day that work for you. It doesn't have to be a whole book. doesn't even have to be a whole chapter. Even if it is just a couple of verses in a devotional, I want you to take the four or more challenge. Okay? Actually, I want to repeat this after me. I will read scripture four or more times a week. I guarantee you as the word dwells richly within you, it renews your mindset, your attitude, your outlook, your purpose. 
So you have permission, friends. Anytime between now and Easter, we're going to hold each other accountable. At any time, you can turn to a church friend or me and say, hey, are you doing four or more? Okay, I'm giving you permission. Let's all hold one another accountable for letting the renewing power of Scripture take root in our lives. Let's pray together today. God, you didn't have to give us the Bible. We're so grateful you did because so often the ways that you speak to us, even the words that we hear in prayer, are rooted in the lessons that we have read and heard in Scripture. We pray, Lord, that we would be people who it dwells within us so richly that it's okay if we come to a passage that we don't understand. We're not turned off by that. We're going to go dig in. We're going to ask people who uh, we trust. We're going to say, what do you think about what this means? We're, we're not going to just be turned off, but we're going to dig deep so that your <laughs> scripture, your, the word of God can do the transformative work that you wanted it to do when you gave it to us in the first place. We thank you, Lord, that you don't just, like, leave us in the dark, but you give us everything we need to know. Give us a hunger and a thirst for it, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please join us in our closing hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. It's page 395 in the hymnal. If you're at home, please sing along with the words on the screen. If you're in the sanctuary, stand as you're able, and we will sing, Take Time to Be Holy. Well, friends, thanks so much for worshiping with us today. I can't wait to worship with you again next Sunday, but who knows what God is going to bring our way between now and then. Hopefully, whatever it is, you're able to find guidance, direction, comfort from the words of Scripture as you go. And we'll have prayer partners up here if you'd like to have them pray for you. Um, We have a youth parents meeting this afternoon. Lots of good stuff going on here at Asbury. But as we go from this place, remember, God goes before you to show you the way. 
behind you to keep you moving, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, and within you always to give you peace. Amen. Thank you.